Hello, this is John Spielman with an audio version of this week's um, column. We, I did years of agony, basically games in which people either were very happy or very unhappy with. So agony and ecstasy it was really, but it was an agony column. And um, now um, I've branched out slightly. The last two columns were on Regina's side, sacrificing your queen. And this one, as you can see, is on metamorphosis. Um, which is pawn, pawn promotion. Um, so pawn promotion, I um, it's one of the miracles of chess. It's one of the reasons that chess is an interesting game. If pawns couldn't promote, then actually the ending would generally be very tedious, because unless there was something big going on, it would be a draw. But of course, because you can promote past pawns, having an extra pawn in a king and pawn ending normally wins, and you know, uh, with more pieces on the board, it often wins anyway or past pawns are, are very powerful. Um, so I was wondering which metaphor to use for this, and I wondered about parthenogenesis, which is basically asexual reproduction. Um, it's a word I knew from Greek myth, but not precisely what it meant. Uh, sorry, this is something different. So uh, a nat natural form of asexual reproduction, but I knew there was a Greek myth where somebody had been born from the head of somebody i couldn't remember which i to be honest and it was actually athena um who was born from zeus's head zeus's mother was metis wisdom and zeus the king of the gods um was told that any child she bore to him uh he had uh in relations with her as the greek gods did and um he was told that any child that she had would be more powerful than him. So he swallowed her, as you do, if you're a Greek god, before she gave birth. But he got terrible headaches, and eventually, apparently, in this version, which I've got here, Hephaestus, the smith of the gods, um, used um, an axe, I think, to smash his head open, and Athena jumped fully formed from his head. So one possible metaphor is that, that the piece, whatever it be, Queen Rook, Bishop or Knight, jumps uh, fully formed from the pawn's head, but that the birth kills it. Uh, probably more sensibly, um, you could say that it's a metamorphosis, like an insect uh, going from, um, what is it, chrysalis to imago? Um, anyway, um, that, uh, 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 whichever metaphor you use, past pawns are scary things when your opponents have them. And I was talking about um, how I feel about them <coughs> and that I got scarred by a past pawn <coughs> excuse me in my teens and I'm just going to check by the way that we are recording I will be one second and this was going to involve a regression and we are sorry about that I'm sorry about the silly screen but I thought I'd better check and um, the um, that this is a game I lost. I think I may have given it here before, but I'm not sure. Apparently, it, it was played on the 27th of December 1972 when I was 16 and three months or something at the Hastings Challengers, and it, it really messed up my tournament. But um, having lost to a horde of past pawns when I won the guy's queen, I was always very, very, I've always been very wary of this, and I think it's informed my chest slightly. I'm less willing to gamble in the late middle game or in the ending, allowing my opponents pass pawns, but calculating that I can win. So to, to trust my calculation against them than some other players, obviously I was uh, strong players. And I'm also, it affects your choice of openings, because for instance, the Grunfeld, as I say down here, it's a lovely opening, but the opponent does get a pass D pawn. So there are two ways it look often. So there are two ways at looking at, I think it's Delroy, isn't it, that uh, Rousen calls him. And this past pawn, or perhaps it's her if it's given birth. But anyway, the past pawn, um, you can either imagine some ghastly late middle game where you've got a queen and a rook left each. The past pawn was in the sixth or seventh, and you're suffering horribly with your rook in front of the pawn, your queen running around, trying to defend yourself while he tries to find a tactical blow to kill you. So that's one way of looking at the past pawn. I mean, he's, you're going to have an extra pawn on the queen side, but maybe it isn't going to help you. And the other way of looking at the past pawn is that it advances, you surround it in the endgame and do your Venus flytrap um, imitation 
of uh, eating the succulent pawn, uh, this delicious morsel. Anyway, um, I tend to, to imagine the former, which is why I hardly ever play the Grunfeld. I mean, only in the abstract, obviously, because this is just a feeling, do I want my opponent to have a pass D pawn? And I'm a bit more nervous than I ought to be, perhaps, about it. Now, we're going to go on to the games. Um, there in column 144, it's not an agony anymore. And the first one is the game Spielmann Schauwecker, Hastings Challengers, 1972. And as I said, it was in December 1972. And I, and I put it in my book of best games because it was so formative to me. And I'm not very interested in the opening. I mean, I didn't play it particularly well. Um, we get some sort of thing rather like a classical French. Um, I don't know if these moves are any good. He's got a knight coming to e4 now. He must be doing okay, presumably. I put my horse in d4, as you do. Put my queen in. Go rook back to f1. I'm thinking about playing f5, maybe. He went here. And now he nicked a pawn. And I think I knew he couldn't nick a pawn. Because I went here and took his knight. But it's a shame I have to take his knight, of course. Because I had to... Um, stop him playing queen f2 after he, I moved the f1 rook. Oh, and I've got this one. I was thinking I had rook b1 and rook c1, but of course then he has d3. I'm only just looking at this game again now. I did look at the variations, so I've trapped his queen. And on a really good day, the guy might have resigned, I suppose, but why should he? He's obviously got compensation. So he gets his rook over. I take his queen. As I said, when you... Uh, play an obvious move like taking this queen then you have to consider whether you'd have a better move and there is this move in fact but black can go bishop b7 queen d6 rook a8 and you're going to play a2 and bishop d5 maybe not bishop d5 too quickly because you don't want f5 to happen and f6 and it's not going to be an easy position for white to win I would have thought because, um, you know, black's very active and the knight isn't doing much. Maybe, I don't know. I can ask its sublime majesty, I shall. And it says, it says it's better without winning. So it doesn't know, is the answer in the time I've given it. Anyway, that's a possibility. I took, and I now played knight c5, which is a good move, defending laterally along the rank and getting the horse in, and now I've played a gross blunder, rook takes rook. And if he'd gone rook checks, king up, pawn takes rook, I would have cursed exceedingly, I would have resigned quite soon, and there wouldn't really have been a story, um, because, all right, it's really unpleasant, you've won the queen, you've lost the game, but it's not like you just did something really stupid. He played the very bad pawn takes rook, again, you should think before you move, even when the move is obvious, and I get him queen b3 now. Stopping rook checks, but he gets an e3. Uh, and this is a really dangerous position because there are two passed pawns and, you know, the king's a bit open. King g2 I played. Uh, I've given this a question mark. I wonder if I should have done. So knight d3, e2, queen takes pawn, rook takes knight, queen takes pawn, bishop b7 check, rook d8. Well, that's a position. White can play it because he can try to attack on the king side. But obviously, um, black can fight. Um, e2, king f2, rook d1. King takes pawn, rook h1. So the, the usual defense. Now, have we got, we got the variations here, haven't we? up here. Okay, I'll show you the game first, what happened. Um, because now I think I'm losing, aren't I? Yep, I think I'm losing. And I lost. I resigned a few moves later. We resigned in this position. Let's go back to the critical position which I skirted over through just going forward arrow. Um... So king g2 is the right move here. a2, queen a3, double the rooks is the best thing you can do. 
takes takes king h3 e3 queen up queen takes pawn pawn, pawn equals rook takes pawn with check this is good for white but it turns out into a draw i believe this line turns into a draw because you go and black is able to give enough checks now and you win the g-pawn and you should draw now where is the winning line how do I get to the winning line the winning line goes it's here isn't it so it's in this position Still can't find the winning line. There's a line with 94, fantastic line. Uh, so this must be right up here. King g2, a2. That's the one. Oh, I see, right, so. King g2, a2. So queen takes e3 is actually a question mark. And you should go queen a8. Here you are. Let's. I'm sorry I'm flapping around in this so much. But it's really quite difficult. So in this position when I blundered, I should have gone king g2, a2. I know it's my game, but it was years and years ago. Queen a8 is the right move. He goes g6 and in this position rather than taking the bishop you play the splendid knight e4 which threatens to go knight f6 check followed by queen takes bishop followed by mate queen g8 and queen f8 mate and this apparently wins he goes king g7 you go knight f6 threatening queen takes bishop he goes rook c2 queen a4 threatens to go to e8 and to mate Pawn equals queen. If bishop b7 to prepare rook c8, knight checks king back, knight to there, stops rook c8, and again you're threatening queen e8 check, and it's the end of the world. Um, these are really difficult lines, actually. Um, you know, I start thinking, could he go rook c6 here, queen takes pawn, bishop a6 to prepare e2. I assume not, because you can go queen a5 and queen e8 and give mate. But you have to think about it. This is winning. So the main line goes queen a4, eight pawn equals queen takes e2, queen a5, bishop b7, knight e8 check. And basically you're winning. You're going to give mate now. So this is incredibly complicated. I've got completely confused by this. And I've unconfused myself. And the important line is that you should play king g2. And then you should play queen e8. I'm going to put in a diagram here. And a note. Didn't work. So I checked it, checked it with an engine, much later. Okay, and there we are. Um, so this is the rather confused um, analysis of this game. Basically, the, the story is that a couple of passed pawns with a rook can sometimes fight against a queen. Um, now what happened next was, I was writing this column, I wanted to show some more stuff, and I spent about half an hour, or maybe three quarters of an hour, looking for a, there's some Levonaronian game, I hope people will be able to help me with this, in which he won as black, I thought it was against Kramnik, but I just couldn't find it, in which there were passports flying around the board, and eventually he got a blockade and won, I couldn't remember it. 
So eventually what I did, I, I, I spent a long time looking for this game. Then I thought, why don't I just look for mad positions with ultra past pawns? And so I thought, let's look for positions with two pawns in the seventh rank. And the first of these is um, this one. This fa famous game, uh, McDonnell Le Bourdonnais, um, where basically taking on c6 is a very bad idea because it just gives black a centre. And they played chess, and he got a bad position quite quickly. c4 is, well, it, it's making past pawns. I'm, I know there, are, there will be notes of, to this somewhere, but I didn't even bother to find them. It's not really important as such. This, I guess, was meant to be an exchange sacrifice. It's possible it wasn't. You don't know, of course, um, you know, what the guys intended. This is what happened. Apparently, rook f2 is actually quite good for white now, I think. is playable, but he went king h1 and then started pushing 40 million past pawns. And, it, and the bishop on d8 and the rook stopped the white's pawn, so black's millions are going to win. And the game ended with a rather splendid... So, um, one question I had was, is there a word for a phobic, a phobia of past pawns, and would people like to coin one, which I will um, put up? So, I don't know, peonophobia or something? Uh, but it's past, it's connected past pawns, isn't it? So it's probably going to, going, to, going to be a conglomeration of Greek. And any classicists, um, please tell me and I will post the idea of the morbid fear of past pawns. So I then, well, I, I knew this game and I thought I'd post it. And then I thought, what about any other games with two past pawns in the seventh rank? And I look for black pawns because they somehow look even more impressive than white pawns. This black, this horde, charging down. Like um, if you have a king's Indian, then the pawns in c4, d5, and e4 don't look that scary. But if you had a king's Indian reverse, the pawns on c5, d4, and e5, white's position looks awful normally. It's just a visual thing. They seem to take a bit more space. Anyway, so I looked for two connected past pawns on d2 and e2, and I actually found 500 instances in a, in a mega base, whatever mega base I've got, which is amazing. So I started going through them in a fairly desultory sort of way. I didn't think I could go through all of them. And I found one where um, your man, um, at this point, black has two connected past pawns, obviously one's going to be taken, and at the end of the game, White plays e6, and white's got two connected pass pawns on e6 and d6. I also found a game, by the way, in which black had two connected pass pawns on d2 and e2, and white had pawns on d7 and e7. But this was two sprogs in the world under 16 who were messing around, uh, who were not playing chess at all, which I don't greatly disapprove of. They're kids. If they do this, I don't care. Even if it's the world junior, they probably weren't the strongest players there, I assume, or they wouldn't have been messing around. But any, anyway, the, the, that game was, I would discount. But this game looks like a perfectly good game. So then I wanted some, a study, a couple of studies uh, with past pawns. And the first is my own study. This is white to play and draw. I could put it into replay training mode, perhaps, and hide this. And it's white to play. And it happens that there's only one way to make a draw. Um, people have a look if you like uh, stop stop this and then carry on so the solution is b7 check king to here take now if pawn equals queen then the knight d6 check so you have to have a knight and you trap the bishop and knight you win one of the pieces and you draw when I did this I think I then looked to see if king to here would work um, and check and here and now I think that at the moment 
you have to go bishop c8, king to here. And I discovered to my great joy that the only winning move in this position is knight d2. So this was purely serendipity because I composed this study. Then I tried to make sure it was sound. And it turns out that in this position, I can ask it at a, a table base. It will tell you that knight d2 is the only winning move. Everything else is a draw. And if you go to here, it tells you that b7 is the only uh, move to draw. So, um, and then king b5, it will give bishop d7 check, bishop c8, and knight d2, as it does. So that was nice. That was a study I composed in... 1970, 1978. Okay, I hadn't realised it was so long ago, actually. So then I, there's, I've got a study here. Um, I don't know if people have seen it, or if you've played through a solution. This is a study by Jan Rusinek, who's a Polish... Um, uh, replay training. A Polish mathematician and study composer. And it's white to play and draw, and it is rather beautiful. I'm just going to play through it so I don't confuse myself. Um, and now the first three moves are pawn equals queen, pawn to there, king to there. So this way, um, white has promoted to a queen before we start the main study. Now, um, given the study theme, which you could guess at from the fact that there are, um, well, there are three more pawns to promote, and we've had a promotion to a queen so far. You might guess what it is. Then the question is whether it's better to start here or uh, in the initial position, the starting position. And I believe that chess players, over-the-board players, prefer this because they think this is a ridiculous position. Why not do a little bit of hacking to get to here? But study composers and study solvers tend to say, oh, too many pieces um, destroyed in the first three moves, and it's such a silly position, as though this isn't a silly position. And so they tend to harumph and say well, that they prefer it to start here. Anyway, the solution goes pawn to there, check. So now you're threatening to play pawn equals rook and to stalemate yourself. That stops that. Have to have a knight with check have to give up the knight. Have a bishop, sorry, you play pawn equals bishop, excuse me. And you've stalemated yourself, so there's only one thing you can do. You can give him some squares, and you go back, threatening mate. And now, if pawn equals queen, we go bishop a6 check, either piece to b7, knight e4, something takes the bishop, and knight e6 mate, so you have a rook, as you do. And it is a draw. So in this beautiful study, White has promoted first to a queen, then to a knight, then to a bishop, and then to a rook. And I knew what a Babson task was, which is, if we look up a Babson task, now let's define it properly. Um, a Babson task. The Babson task has been solved a direct mate with the following properties. White mate's the only move that forces the checkmate. Blah, 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 blah. Black's defences include the promotion of a certain pawn to either a knight, a bishop, a rook, or a queen. Um, if black promotes, then must promote a pawn to the same piece that black just promoted to. This is the only way to force checkmate within the stipulated number of moves. And I suppose I could have included the Babson task here. You can find there is a solution somewhere somebody solved this incredibly difficult problem. Is this the one? Um, oh, somebody... Uh, several other Babsons have been composed by other authors. I didn't know this. The cyclic Babson, who knows, that's going to involve going round um, the promotions in the right order. I don't know, maybe going queen, rook, bishop, knight, because queen is bigger than book. rook is that... Uh, oh, 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 no, no. Black promoting to queen white means one white must promote to a bishop. Heavens. All right, I didn't know about cyclic Babson's, but there is the Babson task, but this is actually the one that I showed you is apparently called, nice German verb, word, an, an alum, 
Alum von Vandlung. I'm sorry about my horrible pronunciation. Um, and so all promotion, presumably. I don't speak German, I'm afraid. Um, and um, so, the, so this splendid uh, problem does that. Right, well, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm sorry I got into a muddle with the analysis of my game with Mr. Schaubecker. There are a lot of variations. I've just pro <coughs> promoted the main line of the defence and um, give, given a diagram there to, there to try to make it easier to navigate to it. So I hope you enjoyed this and please, uh, Johannes has said that if you give, if you suggest um, an idea for a future column, then you will get a premium subscription. So that'll be lovely. And I may ask, I, um, any coinage of phobias would be nice. I'm not sure if we'll do the same thing for that, but please give any coinage of phobias of past of connected past pawns or past pawns either. And um, please do carry on sending in games for the agony column as well because at some point I will return to agony from time to time. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this, and um, I'll be back in a fortnight, I assume. I assume that the next column will be on, come out on Sunday the 5th of July. Okay, cheers then, people.